Good evening. I'm glad that all of you are here. If you were somewhere in the vicinity of my place of being this afternoon, you got wet. It was raining like cats and dogs and trees and lightning everywhere. But it's good that we are all able to be here and I'm thankful for all of you who are in attendance. Tonight we're going to move into the third lesson. We briefly started this last week, but we'll pick back up at the beginning of this because we didn't get too far into it. We're going to continue into lesson number three in this study. Where does this idea of an institutional board come from? And in this lesson, there's several objectives that we're going to look at. We're going to determine what the institutional board is and analyze how it is applied to different concepts according to the non-institutional brethren. We'll explain the position that the non-institutional brethren take on the matter, understand what the Bible says about our giving, then distinguish what the elders have oversight over, and understand what the Bible says about helping others in need. And we're going to kind of tie in a couple of things in with this lesson when we start talking about the institutional board. So we'll begin with understanding what an institutional board is and how it is applied to different concepts. When we think about the institutional board as a whole, in simple terms, it's any group of Christians that form a group and they can be from multiple uh, congregations uh, to, who, who collaborate to do a specific work or make decisions about the work. And we looked at this last week briefly, but I'll, I'll go into some more detail tonight. When we look at this diagram, we'll find that we have uh, the church church blue, church red, church green, and church yellow. And they all have a member from their con respective congregations who might sit on a board of directors for a children's home. This board of directors will oversee works that need to be done within the children's home. Now, I want to clarify something. Is the children's home the Lord's church. Not at all. But these individuals who are members of the Lord's church make up a board who in turn make decisions. Who makes the decisions for the body of Christ? The local body. The elders. And so these individuals may not be an elder. Could they be an elder? Absolutely, but they may not necessarily be an elder. And so what you have is roughly a representative from some different congregation forming this board who's going to make decisions for the children's home, whether it be building maintenance, uh, the supervision of children, who's going to work what schedule, they make financial decisions, uh, they determine what food's going to be bought, how much money is going to be spent on the food, who's going to prepare it, where it's going to be served, how it will be served, so forth. They, they have to make these decisions. But it might also be this. We have Church A who sends their money, the elders send their contribution, Church B sends their contribution. Church C sends their contribution. Church D sends a portion of their contribution. Obviously, it's not the whole contribution, but it's portions of it that are going to a group of elders that oversee a specific work, like the Latin, mission, Latin American missions. In return, the Latin American missions work has different campaigns that they do. They oversee these works. When something needs to be done, maybe it's a construction campaign, they're going to build uh, maybe some homes or they're going to build a, a church building. 
the missionaries in, the, in those lands will relay this information to the elders there that oversee the work and this information will be relayed to us through their bulletin. How often do we get that bulletin? Or their, their news article? I think it comes out, what is it, once, w once a month? Once a month. And so we constantly have updates on works that are being done. Now, I want to I want to ask this question, and I don't want this to be seemed or, or deemed as a silly question. When we're talking about an institutional board, we think about where this idea came from or comes from. Do you find a board in the Bible? Do you find an institutional board existing? in the Bible. Now this could be a trick question. A makeup of this. Well you know it, it depends on how you look at it. Uh, what about the Jewish council? What were they? They were select members that came together to make decision. What about what about the disciples, the apostles? Were they selected? Did they make some decisions? They did. But remember what we're talking, our emphasis is on the difference between the non-institutional brethren and the institutional who claim, the non-institutional claim that we can't give money, the local church cannot give any of their contribution to board members, to an institution. And I want to clarify just some more examples so you can see what I'm talking about. An institution can be linked to a children's home, like the Mount Dora Christian Home and Bible School. They have a board of trustees, and then they have an administrative staff. All of these individuals are members of the Lord's church, but they don't all worship in the same place. Okay? It might be Linked to missions work, like the Gospel Broadcasting Network. There's a sponsoring eldership, a gr an eldership that oversees this work. And they're out of the South Avon Church of Christ in South Avon, Mississippi. They have the elders who oversee it, but they have teams, a management team that does, organizes and oversees this, the daily functions of this work could also be linked to a school of preaching such as the Memphis School of Preaching. The elders oversee the work there at Mem the Memphis School of Preaching. They have directors, associate directors, different deans. Now, will all institutions or all, rather all school of preachings be under the oversight of elderships? Not necessarily. Um, we could have easily put up something such as Fried Hardman University under here. Is it an institution? Yes, it's an educational institution. When we think about these different various institutions, where do we get this idea from of an institution? Is it from the Bible? Or is it a word that we've made up as society has developed, our language has developed? Say what? 
About what? I, I can't hear you. Listen. Could have been. All right, just keep this thought in your mind because we're going to revisit this as we, as we progress through this. Let's look at the position that the non-institutional brethren take when it comes to using the funds for others. Before we look at this, I want us to remember just a couple of things. All authority has been given to Christ, uh, Jesus Christ, Matthew 28, 18. Jesus came and spoke to them saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. We are to abide in Christ, Colossians 3, 17. And whenever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. 2 John verse 9. Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. We have everything that we need to be godly. 2 Peter 2, 2-4 Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord as His divine power has given, us, or given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So all authority has been given to us, or excuse me, all authority has been given to Christ Jesus. As Christians, we're to abide in Christ, and it's through the gospel that we have everything that we need to be godly. Well, according to the non-institutional brethren, there is no direct authority to use the funds of the local body for any institution. There is no authority for us to use any of the funds for an institution. We're going to look at several passages that the non-institutional brethren will use to make this clear. In Acts chapter 2, and I have all of these up here, we'll be going quite rapidly, so just if you would just follow along, or if you can keep up, you can do that as well. In Acts chapter 2, verse 44, now all who believed were together and had all things common. Now, you've heard Fred bring this verse up several times. But I want you to focus on the words that are highlighted here. All who believed. Who would that mean? Christians. Okay? And before we go any further, I'm sorry, I want to make this one more point. We've talked about how serious of a matter this is. And as I go through this, you might begin to question yourself, do they have a point? And we'll address that. So there's no direct authority for us to give to any institution. All who believe, Christians. Look at Acts 4, verse 34 through 35. Nor was there anyone among them who lacked. Now remember, this is just after the, the Acts Day of Pentecost after they've sold and gave their possessions so all could be in common, there was, uh, nor was there anyone among them who lacked. Well, who's the among them? It's the Christians. For all who were possess or possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet and they distributed to each as anyone had needed, or anyone had need. Well, who are, who's the each here? Christians again. We move on to Acts 11, 29. Then the disciples, each according to his ability, determined to send relief to the brethren dwelling in Judea. Well, who's the brethren? 
Christians. Romans 15, 25 through 26. But now I am going to Jerusalem to minister to the saints. For it pleased those from Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor among the saints who are in Jerusalem. Who are the saints? Who's the poor among the saints? It's going to be Christians. Because if I'm among the saints, what does that mean? I am a saint. First Corinthians 16, 1 through 2. Now concerning the collection for who? The saints. As I have given orders to the churches of Galatia, so you must do also. On the first day of the week, let each one of... Now you would be who? Christians. Lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there may be no collections when I come. Are you notice a pattern? noticing a pattern? Who are they giving to? Christians. Hmm. Second Corinthians nine one. Now concerning the ministering to the saints, it is superfluous for me to write to you. You see, according to these scriptures, the only individuals that can receive funds from the local body of Christ is those who believe. The brethren the saints. Now, let me reemphasize. This is the non-institutional position. Okay, I want to make that clear. This is what the non-institutional brethren teach. Yes. So, if a destitute person who wasn't a Christian came to the building and needed food, um, they would. They'd have to give individually. They couldn't take out of their church contribution. Correct. We have a pantry back here. Right? Yeah. Somebody comes up. We could not go back to that pantry and give to them from the church. It would have to be an individual act. But in Jesus' time... Uh, we're not there yet. No. <laughs> we're not there yet. We're, we're, we're not there yet. I, see, if you're like me, and that's my next point, aren't these institutions brethren? You know, these so-called institutions, when we go back, I'll go back real quickly, when we go back to this, that's a Christian home and Bible school. These are Christians. These folks. Bob, you ever met Don Blackwell? You ever heard him speak? Have you ever heard him speak false doctrine? What about Glenn Colley? I know Glenn real well. He followed me in Israel. You see, these are Christians. So, when we start to unfold this, and we're looking at giving to the saints, giving to the brethren, what's happening? When the elders decide to give money, where's it going? And, the, and when it comes to these works, the work of children's homes, when it comes to the work of missionary support, a school of preaching, what's happening? It's being given to the saints. Now, your second thought might be, wait a second, there's no way that one can limit who the funds are for. What about Galatians 6.10? Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to some, to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. Now, remember what we're talking about. What Nikki 
just brought out. Because I want you to collect yourself here for a second, because I'm going to show you something that's, and again, until I looked at this, I never understood their position. Can I give individually to the poor? But we're talking about the church's collection. Turn with me to Galatians 6. You can turn in your Bibles now. Galatians chapter 6. Because I'm about to show you something. Well. Galatians chapter 6 verse 1. Brethren, if a man, how many is that? One. Is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, how many is that? You. One. Lest you, one, also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone, how many is that? It can be one or it could be many. If anyone thinks himself to be something, when he, how many is that? One. Is nothing, he deceives, how many? Himself, one. But let, how many? Each one examine his own work, and then he will have rejoicing in himself alone. And what? Not in another. For each one shall bear his own load. Let him who is taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked for whatever a man, how many is that? One. Whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, but he who sows to the Spirit will, uh, to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. And let us, now who does us mean? You and I, Christians. Let you and I not grow weary while doing good. For in due season, we, you and I, shall reap if we, you and I, do not lose heart. Therefore, as we, you and I, have opportunity, let you and I do good to all especially to those who are of the household of faith. What's the context of the we, you, and I? Is it singular? And meaning individually? Or is it plural? Well, this is the argument that the non-institutional brethren are going to make. If you study with them, who's to do good? All men. But in the context of this passage, what's being addressed here? How many? It's a man individually. Now, how many of you are like scratching your head right now? Be honest. Only one of you? <laughs> now, tell me, why are you confused? I just put my confusion in and I trust the other. Some of it seems contradictory. 
Why, why, why does it seem contradictory? First it's one, it seems to be one way, and then it seems to be another way. Brother Pauline, you said you don't have any idea, so you don't know where I'm trying to go with this. Well, you've lost me for three weeks. <laughs> now, now, I know we say that and we, we laugh at that, but it's not. And, and, and you're right, because I'm going to tell you something. If you ever study with someone who believes this, it's not going to be a laughing matter. And to sit there and try to explain to them, what are you talking about? That is not what that says. Because let me point this out to you. We're talking about one individual doing good unto all men. Does God require something of me that he doesn't require it of you? No. And so if we're talking about helping people, if we're talking about doing good unto all men, if somebody walks up to this door, what should be our first reaction? Why? What did Jesus say? If I was hungry, you fed. Matthew 25. What did we do this for? What can we do? At least the one need you've done it under me. And was he talking to strictly disciples there? See, he was talking to the people that were there, the crowd. See, when you start studying this, Scripture begins to be pulled out and taken out of context. And it's molded to fit a view. But when you bring up something else, and I'll, and I'll bring this up in a few moments, the non-institutional brethren will say, well, you can't use that because it doesn't apply to the passage that we're talking about. See, according to the Scriptures, on institutional position, there is no direct authority for the local congregation to support the orphans, the poor outside of the body of Christ, or even those who are true widows. These are simply works that individuals must do, not the local body of Christ. Galatians 6:10, James 1, 2 through 27, 1 Timothy 5, 3 through 16 tells us thing, tells us these things. Yes, ma'am. Well, I didn't say they weren't going to heaven. What don't they do? Well, uh, well, I want to clarify something. I haven't said that they're not going to heaven because I'm not the judge. You're saying they're wrong. What I'm saying is they're wrong in their teaching that if we give as we do, then we sin. And that's the whole point of this. You see, the, according to them, the only authority that the local body of Christ has to help the saints directly in, is in one of these manners. It goes back to our first or second lesson. One church can send money through one person and deliver it to another church. That's the only way that we see in the Bible the, the local congregation giving of their funds. And therefore, they teach that if you, because we have the direct example of this or this, giving to an individual or this method, directly giving, if you do anything other than these, then you are sinning and you're not going to go to heaven. Well, you bring up the widows 
And I'm going to, I'm telling you folks, <laughs> when you read this, it's going to make you scratch your head for a second. And I got it coming up in just a few slides. Um, but I'll, I'll go ahead and touch on that. Go ahead and turn with me over to 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy, let's see here. 1 Timothy chapter 5. And we're going to start with verse 3. And this is why this is so important to discuss this stuff. Verse 3. Honor widows who are really widows. Now I'm going to stop right there. Honor widows who are really widows. Well, what's a widow? A uh, a woman whose husband has died. But let's keep reading. Because if you ask me what a widow is, that's what I'm going to tell you. It's a woman whose husband's died. Verse 4. But if any widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show piety at home and to repay their parents, for this is good and acceptable before God. Now she who is really a widow... And left alone, trusts in God and continues in supplication and prayers night and day. But she who lives in pleasure is dead while she lives. And these things command that they may be blameless. But if anyone does not provide for his own and especially for those of the household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Do not let a widow under 60 years old be taken into the number, and not unless she has been the wife of one man. Well reported for good works, if she has brought up children, if she has lodged strangers, if she has washed the saints' feet, if she has relieved the afflicted, if she has diligently followed for every good work, but refused the younger widows, for when they have begun to grow wanton against Christ, they desire to marry, having condemnation because they have cast off their first faith. Besides, they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, and not only idle, but also gossips and busybodies saying things which they ought not. Therefore, I desire that the younger widows marry, bear children, manage the house, give no opportunity for the adversary to speak reproachfully, for some have already turned aside after Satan. Verse 16. If any believing man or woman has widows, let them relieve them, and do not let the church be burdened, that it may relieve those who are really widows. So as a whole, will they, will they help any widow? Not any widow, but what is really a widow? It's a woman who has no family whatsoever. Destitute. Years. Right. 60 years older, destitute. If she has grandchildren, is she a real widow? Does she have someone who can take care of her? Now, I wanted to find something of this. Because I want you to think about this. Because there's a lot of language that plays on this. When you look at verse 16, do not let the church be burdened. What would that consist of? What would a burden, what would be a burden to the church? Just a real quick question. And these are to our two elders who are here tonight. If we had a widow who her, her husband died, she had some small kids. 
Her husband was the only one who worked. And now all of a sudden, she's stuck with a mortgage, car payment, electric bill. Let's just say she had to come up with $14,000 to pay her next month's bill. Is that going to be a burden? It's probably going to be a burden. But does that mean that we're not going to help her? Are we going to say she's not a true widow? Would, we, would you reject that? I'm talking to the two elders. Would you say, sorry, we can't help you? Why? By the same token, could we probably come up with that money amongst ourselves? We probably could. But are we going to be willing to support that every month? Are we going to be the sole provider? See, I think that's what's being said here. The church is not to be the sole provider for any family. How many of you have ever been in a time of need? Time of need. How many of you ran off when you were young and got married? Because you knew what you were doing. <laughs> Ms. Reba, Mr. Kenny, how long did y'all know each other? No, how, how, long, how long did you know each other before you got married? A year, two and a half years? Did you know what you were doing? How old were you when you got married? Yes, sir. 25. 25. 25 and you got married. Now you're a little older than I thought when you got married. Somebody, I thought somebody got married when they were like 18. Who got married when they were 18? Somebody was here. Fred, you did? No. Oh. Absolutely. you brought up that that point because in studying these things you might hear someone of the non-institutional congregation say we have to do things the way they did in the first century well I would caution people on making statements like that they sure didn't and that's and and, and And they didn't have a nice air-conditioned building either. Because I'm telling you right now, if we had to be sitting with the windows open right now, y'all would have already thrown the songbooks at me. Mob shaking his head, yeah, real hard. <laughs> you have to apply the principles from the first century to the 21st. Exactly. And when we're talking about these widows, the... The point is that we're not supposed to be, the church is not designed to be somebody's employer. As in, like, we support this person because she doesn't want to work. See, there's an obligation on the individual's behalf, too. And again, um, common sense tells us that if there is a widow 
that only has grandchildren left as her surviving family, and those kids are not of an accountable age, an adult age, how can they take care of her? In my book, she's a real widow. <laughs> right. You know, you know. Common sense tells you that. And so... <clears throat> When we look at this, and, and again, I, I'm, I'm trying to point out what the non-institutional brethren teach. The only authority that we have in the local body of Christ is that we are to help the saints directly. And they go on to claim that this is evident based off 2 Corinthians 9, 12 through 13. For the administration of this service not only supplies the needs of the saints, but also is abounding through many thanksgivings to God while the proof of uh, his ministry, they glorify God for the obedience of your confession and to the gospel of Christ for, uh, for, for all liberal sharing with them and all men. And I have this right here. I meant to block that out first, but with all men. If you notice in your Bibles, and again, this is one of the arguments that will be made, that word men is in italics, which means what? It was added. And so if you block that out, if liberal sharing with them and all, the passage up here is talking about saints. And so all men was added. How do you not know that it wasn't implying all saints? Well, Common sense will tell us, if we've read the Bible at any length and studied it at any length, did Jesus Christ only do good to those who believed Him? Who is supposed to be our ultimate example? Our Lord, our Christ. And if He was willing to help people who didn't believe Him and still did it, what does that tell us? Well, you know, and you're, you're, but again, when we're looking at these issues, because I'm telling you, and I'll wrap this up quickly, when you're studying with someone and your Bibles are open and they're pointing this out to you, Then does it stop and make you think? I mean, if you're truly coming at it with a sincere heart, it's tough. Yes, Bob? Think about what it says in, in James 1.27. Pure religion, unfiled before God, is this. What it really boils down to, and they're trying to say pure religion is something that only can be done here by the individual. Right. And I'm telling you, what Brother Bob has just brought up, when I was told that very same thing, it was as hard as it could. It was, you don't understand how hard it was not for me to just stand up and walk away. Yes, Brother Cooper. I'm sorry, say that. Yeah. That's right. Who would? And I, I saw this when it was coming up. One of the things that amazed me, though, and we need to remember, we don't live in the same kind of situation, same kind of generation. Right. When it comes to the matter of helping a missionary, sending support to a missionary, I remember one of the best known teachers of this non institutional situation. Uh, he said, I don't know whether we can afford to trust the United States Post Office to send the money over there. That we're going to have missionaries. But maybe we really have to send the man to care. You know, that's, we have to recognize the circumstances.
is we're in, and elders have to make and I'm going to leave it there because that's going to move into our next section on what the elders have oversights of, and we'll pick that up next week. Next week. Uh, I know we've gone over a little bit. Oh, next week is singing in two weeks. So y'all remember this? There'll be a quiz. No, I'm just kidding.